They squared off two nights ago. It was enthralling. It was physical. It came with many a tale to tell, and it went Port Adelaide's way. An 11 points victory at Adelaide Oval. It puts Port right in the running at seven and six. The Cats are still ladder leaders at 11 and two. And the coaches come together in the old coaches' corner style, club corner, I think it was. Chris Scott, welcome. Thanks, Jared. Ken Hinckley's got the bragging rights. Welcome, Kenny. Thanks, Jared. So we want an accord here that you can both feel empowered to speak about your own team without it being a slight on the other. Do you both agree? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Ken? Yep, I'm OK because I've got a bit of distance between here and there. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, when you go into matches against the Cats, in the last couple, I feel that you've played a real aggressive brand of football. Like, people say that we do that all the time. It seemed to me that... You like going after Geelong aggressively in the man, some big bumps and the tackling. Is that is that part of your preparation for a Geelong game? Uh, not so much a part of our preparation. As you said, it's in every game. But I think we acknowledge the, the strength of the, and the quality of the opposition. And we know how good they are and how, and how strong they are around the ball. So if, you're, if you can't prepare yourself to be in a really serious contest, you've absolutely got no chance. And our record against the Cats is, is not, a, not a flattering record. So we, we may have tried that a few times and unfortunately it hasn't worked very often for us, but I'm just really pleased that it worked for a Saturday night. So when it does work and you're talking to the boys before they run out or whenever you're talking to them last to get them mentally fired up, do you say to them, I want you to go out there and I want you to hurt them, I want them to feel every time they get the ball there's going to be one, two players coming at them? Yeah, no, not so much. It's not, not a team thing that we'd go after any team like that. We'd, we want to be that type of team every time we play. There's no, no um, Geelong dependent upon that. It's just the way we'd like to play. And Port Adelaide, you know, in their history, play that way. And that's the way we expect our team to play. So the postscript to it is, as two players are sitting on one-game suspensions as it's come back from the MRO today, Ken, is, were, you, uh, were you expecting that? How, how, do you, how do you feel about the suspensions of Amon and Howard? Yeah, clearly disappointed that they've both got a suspension. But I think, you know, we, we, we expected there'd be some, some, something come out of it and, w and what that was going to be. You know, in both cases, we'll, we'll look over them tonight, Chris Davies and, and the team will go over them and, and see what room we have, if we have any room to move. Um, we understand, particularly in the Amon one, we understand that the bump and, and what happens out of the bump is, is really important to the uh, match review. So we probably get that. The Dougal one's slightly different for mine is that we look at it and go, you know, you know, it, it's intentional because it's off the ball. I think it's from a centre bounce, and when you're playing key forward, and the ball's um, you know being bounced, you're not off the ball. You're not out of play. You're actually in the play because the rule changes allowed that to happen. And I think that's really important for us. To Harry tries to restrict Dougal, and certainly Dougal gets it wrong with uh, with his action to try and get away from a, a really high quality defender. Chris. <clears throat> Did you think there was some cheap shotting going on from poor players? The Carl Amon incident we just saw there, the Hartlett one, did you think that was good for football? Or did you think, hey, that was a bit, little bit late there? What was your gut reaction to both of them? Um, oh, that they're worthy of MRO scrutiny. Um, but I don't think it had an impact on the game. Um, and I did think a little bit about it before the show. Uh, and it reminded me a little bit of Port's game against Melbourne in round one. We watched that really closely because we were playing Melbourne round two. And the commentary seemed to be around Port bullying or getting into Max Gorn and that's why they won. It had very little to do with why they won. Max Gorn actually got an accidental knee in the head early in the game, which might have held him up a little bit. But Port just outplayed them. And, and that's what happened on the weekend with us as well. They just outplayed us. Right in what areas? In what right areas? Well, it was pretty obvious. Did you watch the game? I watched the game, yeah, so absolutely. They, so they slaughtered us in the contested ball, which they're good at. Mm. Um, but we've been pretty good at that as well. And they just dominated the clearances. And so on a night which was always going to get a bit slippery as the game went on and become a bit more of a territory battle, if you get hammered in the clearances in a territory battle, you're going to have to play some spectacular footy outside of that. And really, to get to within 11 points... I don't think really reflected their, their dominance. They missed some, some pretty easy shots that they'd normally take. So we, we, we acknowledge, although not necessarily accept, that um, while they were better on the night, um, you know, I mean, we, we could have played better, but they, they outplayed us. Sometimes it happens. Kenny, tell me if I'm wrong and tell me if I'm wrong. Because it looked like you went in with the plan to keep the ball. Go short, keep it ball. Honour those people coming at you, Ken. 
How, how long did that survive? Because the game really tightened up after that initial period where I thought you weren't going down the line. You weren't just going to dob it for Harry and Stewart and all these people can just have their aerial dominance and they can bounce out. Yeah, it's interesting, Robbo, because the game, when you look at it for us uh, in, in two quarters, we, you know, the first and the last, we were able to take a few marks against Geelong and that, that was probably a way we would have liked to have been able to get it. But then it became this real contested battle and both sides were, were forcing each other, I think, quite wide and, you know, and playing a pretty strong brand of defence football and, uh, you know, we were forced into a game that, that we had to accept and, and probably embrace and we certainly were able to do that for, for the most part of the game and, as I said, the quality of the opposition we knew we were coming up against and my key message to our team was that we, we can't possibly believe we can win this game unless we play four quarters of proper footy and, uh, you know, Geelong, they don't sit on top of the table a game clear for no other reason other than they're a great side and they play tough footy and, you know, not just because Chris sits there, that's what I believe about them. So what do you take, that? both coaches, what do you take out of it for, for, as, as the win? What, what does it do to the players to beat Geelong? After you dropped, sorry, and after you made some really big selection decisions, Kenny, and you've gathered the troops and said, right, we're playing the best team in the competition, what does that do? Oh, look, it's, it's an interesting one. It, it, does, it does a bit in, the, in the, the, the very immediate future, but it doesn't last for long. You get to Monday and you feel confident about a great performance, but you then look at the draw and you know you've got to do it again this week. And we've been, you know, we've been that side that hasn't been able to consistently get the results that we would like week after week, and Geelong have been. So for us, it's just a reminder that we're capable and we've got to go back to work again today and make sure that we front up big time again Saturday night for the Bulldogs. So what do you take out of it, Chris? Uh, quite a bit. Yeah, we, um, I mean, we've got a terrible, terrible record post-buy. I, I don't buy into that um, as much, but we need to look at that. And that's sort of really the, the questions that we should raise are around our physical preparation, which we've absolutely done. We've, we've done different things in different years. And I think the important thing is to not so much focus on the previous years, but look at what we, we've done with this group, who are a different group. And we had some individuals who are at different stages of their physical preparation due to sort of niggling injuries and that sort of thing. And we ask ourselves the question, is the investment in later in the year worth it, even if we do get a poorer performance um, directly post buy? Mm. Um, interestingly, we've got to, I think we've run seven of the last seven of the next game. Um, I don't think that means anything either, um, to, to be honest. But it can sound a bit defensive if you say, oh, look, we've won, we've lost whatever it is. How, how many is it? Eight. Eight. Eight in a row, sort of post mid season buy. It looks a bit defensive if you say, oh, that doesn't matter. It's, it, it's irrelevant. But to the game itself, you just can't play really good contested teams and just get slaughtered right from the start. I think the clearances were nine zip early in the game. Um, and then that changes the way that you need to play because it's just impossible to sit in the coach's box and say, well, let's keep doing what we're doing and hope it turns around. Um, and then, you know, the obvious stuff, like sometimes you just get some individuals who play poorly. Port's midfield collectively were really good, but they didn't mm. really sit on Kelly. They didn't really, correct me if I'm wrong, Kenny, sit on Dangerfield. Those guys collectively just beat our guys. I mean, Tim Kelly, it's the first game in about 30 whatever it is, five games, yeah. I reckon that he's had a really, really poor one. Um, so sometimes, you know, you can get tagged out of it. This was one where he was just beaten by a better group on the day. So was it galling not to put the buy conversation to bed? Because that's within... It's partially within your power. If you win, that ends yeah, that. A little bit, but it's not high on my radar. So, again, I'm not saying it's unimportant. I'm not, I'm not saying that people shouldn't talk about it. It's not an issue at all. It's clearly there. But... I mean, I'm sure if we had have won, the the argument would have been, gee, Port haven't beaten Geelong for a long time. But the team Port were last year is not really relevant. It's certainly not relevant from the team they were in 2012, but it's good media fodder. Hey, I was going to say, I'm not going to be defensive. I, I reckon it means rubbish. It just yeah, means... Right. I do. You get beaten by... It's, 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 yeah. it's, yeah. it's it, something it to talk about. It started sluggishly. You lost the yeah, first nine clearances, and it's not the first yeah. time off a week off that the team has struggle to hit their straps quickly and some of those games have been out of reach by the time they've got into it. So now you're talking. That, that, that is a bigger issue, um, a more important issue and that is real. So the biggest issue we had, besides some of the things we decided to tweak with our game style last year, was in some big moments we were just terrible. And they weren't all early in games but a lot of them were. Even the week before the bye, we had a bad first quarter against Richmond. 
had an outstanding second and third quarter. Yeah, you did. Yeah. But th that is something that's been a real positive of our year so far. We haven't had those um, 15, 20 minute periods where we've been really, really poor. Uh, and on the weekend we had more than a couple of those periods. So th that, that's what we're concentrating on. Can, can I just ask yep. one more of Kenny? Um, you've coached Brave. You coached Brave during the pre-season, the off-season. It felt like you coached Brave at selection. How big are those decisions, Ryder and Westhoff and Pow Pepper? And do you hold your breath as you wait for the reply? And when you get it like that, what's it worth to you? Yeah, it's, um, it's certainly a challenging moment for a coach because uh, the players we talk about, in particular the two more senior players, are, they've been such great players for us as a football club, Jared, and uh, you know, we respect them enormously. And, you know, but we know sometimes that you're just out of form, and when you're out of form, and no matter how long you, uh, you try to support them and stay at it, you, the only way to fix is to just have a little break from it and go back and, you know, and, and make some corrections to your game and, and work back into some really solid form, which I believe both, both the two senior boys will certainly be able to do. So that will be an issue that they have to take care of in the next few weeks. But for us, you know, it's certainly been a, a decision as a club that we, we need to be brave and we need to be aggressive in what we're trying to do because we're trying to catch the teams at the top of the ladder. We've been that team that's sat mid-table and we've been un unhappy to be that mid-table team. We don't want that to be us and we want us to be a team that's capable of challenging the very best teams in the competition. So if we've got to be brave to be different, that's what we had to be and we've been able to stick to that the whole way through. So how do you keep Ryder motivated, Kenny? Because you, you will know as well as we do as the commentary late last week around... Um, the idea of being elsewhere, whether it's his or somebody else's, how do you keep him on edge to win his place back when Lysette rucks alone and is the best player on the ground? Yeah, we get it. I mean, Paddy gets that too. And uh, he wants to play and he wants to stay at Port Adelaide, I have no doubt. He's very, very familiar with our football club now and he, and he loves being a part of our football club. We, we understand there's interest in all players out there in the market. Paddy, I think, will, will show us what it means to him to stay at Port Adelaide and want to stay at Port Adelaide with his form in the next couple of weeks. I'm sure about that. And, uh, you know, it, it's, a big, it's a big moment for Paddy. It's the first time he's been challenged probably from a form point of view in, in my memory and that was even at Essendon. So it's, it's a real opportunity for him to go back and show people that he loves still playing football and wants to play for Port. I always look at the big guys when they play footy and I, I, I really look at them and, and how they lead and how they play. I reckon everyone can learn off them and, and surge off them. I thought Scott Lysett was clearly best. Was there special instruction, or please tell us, Kenny, was there special instruction to Lysett to play, to play the athletic Stanley? His ability to take it out of the ruck was really important. Absolutely important. I haven't seen a ruckman this year take it out of the ruck and influence a game like that. Was there special instructions or not? The special instruction to Scott was to play well to hold your spot in the team. I think that's really critical that we've got to understand that he, he's seen what happened and he's seen Paddy Ryder go out of the team. Both boys felt the, the disappointment of the week before in Fremantle. So let's, let's not make any secret of the fact Scott Lysett knew he had to play well to remain in the football team and that was really important. And when you get challenged and you get pressed, Scott, he's been great for us for most part of the season, but he's had a quiet couple of weeks. He's a player who needs to play on the edge and I think he certainly played on the edge. And we didn't instruct him to take the ball out of the ruck. That's the way he felt on the night. For him to play like that was just a, a great credit to him, but it shows the level that he's capable of and what we expect now. Last question, we'll go to that break. Are you saying before the, before the game that you said to him, you've got to play well because I've just dropped Ryder, so you have to play well because if you don't, I'm going to bring Ryder back into the team. Is that how you approached it? Uh, well, it's close enough to accurate, Robbo. It's not quite exactly right, but it's, it's close enough to accurate that you need to play well. We're not messing around as a football club. We've got to make decisions that'll make us better quickly. And one of those decisions we've already made, don't let, don't let yourself become number two or three in that list of, of decisions. Yeah, they're big Thanks. moments. Oh. They're big moments. All right, our coaches are with us. We'll broaden out from that game. Chris Scott and Ken Hinckley on uh, Coaches Night here on 360. It's player takeover round here at Fox Footy. On the couch, Marcus Bontempelli and Jeremy Howe are taking their places with Jared Healy and Gary Lyon for Couch with a Difference. Ball down the line, rough head from the back, unable to take it. More handball was broken up, but he slapped it into the path of Gunston. Left foot high ball, got it away in time. It lands, it goes through. Took a kind bounce, it lands right in the goal square. That's unbelievable. Massive high floating ball that no swan got anywhere near. <laughs> 
front brain fades, not having your head in the game. Um, how do you view those ones as coaches? Mark, uh, Mark Williams, I think it was Peter Berger on in a final, he played on the side of the goal screen. He says, you can't coach that, you can't coach it. Sort of drove him right to the edge of Saturday. How do you coach that? Um, do you just have to let some things slide or...? I think so. I think some things are so obvious. It's a bit... I mean, in a way, it's good you don't have the runners as much as <laughs> you do because you feel compelled sometimes to send the runner out and state the bleeding obvious. And I think that can be a bit condescending, even in the moment. Um, I remember as a player, the runner come out, and you'd stop him 20 metres away, I'm aware. <laughs> but, yeah, there are, there are some, <laughs> some things that are difficult to coach. And probably the, the other side of the coin is sometimes opposition players do some things and you you just got to dip your lid to them and say, well... There's not much we can do about it that. It was a great goal, actually. I know they didn't get there. It yeah. was under a tremendous... Yeah, oh, unbelievable goal. On his left. Yeah. It probably should have been touched, though. <laughs> 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 so how do you deal with those ones, Kenny, when you sort of, Oh, dear. That's uh, Hurley not touching that oh, ball. Yeah. yeah, when it is the bleeding obvious. Yeah, it's uh, it's just it's uh, it's one you just got to deal with. It's not an easy one, but uh, you know you're right. You just got to get over it and get on. I thought Chris's comment about not having the runners. It's a great time not to have a runner because you, you just don't solve any problems there. You don't fix anything. All you do is demoralise the player, perhaps even more so at that point in time. Um, you, you do the correction when you get a chance. You understand that mistakes happen and they're not deliberate. They just happen. So you you well you've mentioned the runner. So Franklin got stranded on the bench for a period of time. John Longmire says the runner might have rectified that. Is, is that one of the issues that arises with the runner? I need to be a little bit careful here because I'm not sure. But they were on the boundary line screaming at a player to come mm. off and he wouldn't come. He's on the other I'd, side of the ground. I, well, either because he didn't think it was the right time to come off or he had his own reasons for not coming. But it's not as if the message wasn't being communicated. Mm. Now, it wasn't via a runner, but... There was time. I, I, I thought, but I could have been wrong. At either of your footy clubs last week after the Jaden Stevenson issue, was there a conversation with player groups around what happened and to reinforce um, the prohibitions, Kenny? Not, not in the collective, no. No, certainly not. But our players and every player, I think, in the AFL are really aware of of the gambling rules, so we, we, we talk about it and they're, they're conversations that go on all the time when that news breaks, that what's going on here, how did that possibly go on? And, and you understand that the news breaking is enough of a reminder for every football club, I think, that, that that's the rules, you shouldn't be in those territory. And, and for us, it was a very simple one for everyone to take a little bit of a lesson. OK, we're hearing it again and we see what happens and we understand why those rules are in place. When you... Um can we off but gambling? No, can I just... Uh, Sorry. Just, oh, just really quickly, I mean, we've spoken before about s sometimes that well, the hardest lessons are the ones that you've got to learn through your own mistakes, but everyone should learn through others' mistakes as well. And the, the only other thing I'll add is I find it a little frustrating that some people are choosing to conflate this issue with problem gambling. They're two separate issues. Jaden Stevenson's not a problem gambling gambler. And, and then the wider issue of um, sports betting, advertising and that, they're, they're, they're all... They're, they're all separate. I just, I'm, you know, I was a bit frustrated by that. They all come up though. That's what happens. I'm not defending it. Yeah, but, but, but it's I think always people... the fallout. It's always the fallout. Yeah. But I think people should be smart enough to separate the issues, unless they're being deliberately disingenuous. Can I ask you a question, uh, Kenny, about coaching and art of coaching? You play Brisbane this week. You'll have to choose a defender to play on Charlie Cameron. Don't give him highlights of last week's game <laughs> against um, St Kilda. <laughs> When do you tell a player that he's got Charlie Cameron? Do you do it early in the week so he can think about it? Or you tell him Friday night, if Friday, he's only got one day to think about it? Well, I'll use a real, I'll use a real example for you, Robbo. Um, on Monday, I told uh, Tom Cleary that he was going to play on Tom Hawkins. And, uh, you know, we knew Tommy Cleary hadn't been in absolutely great form over the last couple of weeks, but we felt as if that the challenge was what he needed to get himself up and about and go because he's been such a good player for us. So we elected to tell him on Monday to fill him with confidence that we believed he could do the job, you know, and, and knew that if he was played at his absolute best, he could play on a player as ho good a quality as Hawke was and beat him. So we, we made that decision on Monday and Hawke, I think, had five weeks in a row where he'd kicked four goals. So that was a pretty daunting challenge to face for a player, but... I thought in this circumstance the best timing was to do it early and allow Tom Cleary to be ready for the challenge. What about Charlie Cameron this week? 
Why don't you tell us now? We're not playing, playing Charlie Cameron this week. No, no. Oh, you're not. We're Sorry. Not so I've got the games wrong. I've got the games wrong. Jeez, I just made an idiot of myself. <laughs> <laughs> For the first time on TV. Uh, the, the good news is it's not the first time. No. <laughs> when you play, when you play no. Brisbane next, how early in the week would you play? Which is in two weeks. <laughs> is it really? Yes. Right. I, when do you tell that yeah, person? Yeah, we play. We play in a couple of weeks. When do you tell that oh, person? Oh no, we'll we'll make those decisions. We'll make those decisions uh, at the right moment, but it'll be pretty early because our selection's done usually pretty early. As it's found out last week, we'd made some selection decisions that the whole world knew about on Wednesday and we hadn't even announced <laughs> to anybody else that that, that that was what was going on. So Charlie will know pretty early, I'd imagine, from what happens here sometimes. Do you feel for Richo this week, Kenny? Yeah, absolutely I do. I, I feel for any coach that's in our jobs and you know the boys who have just lost their jobs and, and the pressure that's mounting on on Alan and then I hear the commentary about John and all those things. People just don't get how hard and how tough this job is to, to, to be involved with all the time. I think Richo's a really strong individual. He'll handle it really well. I'm, I'm absolutely certain he'll come out of it um, strong and ready to go again and that's just what Richo is. What about you, Coach? How do you feel? You had your brother, you look at Richo, you got to know Richo pretty well over the last two years on this show. How do you, how do you look at it? Yeah, I think the, um, the empathy that Ken speaks of is real. Um, and it's, it was communicated to me before I took the... Even, even before I, well before I took the Geelong job as an assistant coach, someone that I really respect said, you'll never really understand what it feels like until you're in that chair. And, and that's been the case for me. And I, I would consider most of my time to have been somewhat of a charmed run. So that only increases the empathy I have for you know, some of the guys that have been dealt a harsher card. And I think, I've said it before, but win-loss for a coach is one of the most overrated things um, yeah, you know, yeah. in, in coaching because every situation is different and some jobs are harder than others. Chris, Kenny, great to have you with us after you played on Saturday night. Thanks to both of you. Thanks, boys.